the smartest film critic in the world, Cole Smithy. Hi, this is Cole Smithy with ColeSmithy.com and your guide to what to see and what to avoid at the movies this week. Awesome. Between Chadwick Boseman's riveting portrayal of James Brown and this film's pitch-perfect kaleidoscopic narrative form, Get On Up is the kind of musical biopic audiences await with bated breath. So you want to be a singer? Oh, no, sir. What I really want to be? Mechanic. Mm -hmm. You got a problem? Aside from being the first truly respectable movie to come out of Hollywood this year, Get On Up gives voice to the varied struggles that James Brown overcame on his way to becoming the hardest working man in showbiz. Evidence that it was always the singer, not the song, the film brilliantly shows off James Brown's charisma and infectious energy while also providing glimpses of his notorious temper, which found lightning rods in his wife and band members. Although the film's committee of screenwriters are careful not to show more than a few of Brown's angry outbursts for fear of alienating audiences, they convey the gist of his volatile personality. The hazard of biopics rests with how a subject's life story is compressed, ordered, and told. Filmic biographies of musicians pose special problems because the audience has to buy the actor standing in for the musically gifted performer whose life comes under the camera's microscopic lens. To this end, Chadwick Boseman's transformation into the man who introduced funk to white audiences is unassailable. Boseman tackles Brown's vigorous dance moves with complete authority. His embodiment of James Brown from age 16 to 60 is nothing short of phenomenal. Bozeman's portrayal of Jackie Robinson in last year's 42 was impressive, but his work here as James Brown reveals a young actor in complete command of his craft. Arriving on the heels of John Brewer's essential documentary, B.B. King, The Life of Riley, similarities between the childhoods of King and Brown come to the fore. Both were left to fend for themselves as boys, and each transferred their love of gospel music into a personalized blues form that skyrocketed them to fame and fortune beyond the Chitlin Circuit, famous for exploiting the musicians that played its southern roadhouse route. I look after James Brown. I knew that I would not. No one else helped me. I knew that I would not. No one else. Rural scenes in South Carolina of the only child, James, living in a shack with an abusive alcoholic father and a desperate mother set the stage for the singer's rebelliousness to flourish after escaping his parents' deforming clutches. Stealing a suit from a car seat costs James a few years in the pokey where he meets gospel singer Bobby Bird, unforgettably played by Nelson Ellis. Once out of jail, the two men team up to form the Fabulous Flames, a short-lived band that launches James Brown as a star singer and band leader. It's after the Fabulous Flames foray into popular blues territory with a rockin' version of Louis Jordan's Caledonia, following a performance by Little Richard, that the movie delivers one of its best scenes. Outside the diner, where Little Richard, played by Brandon Smith, slings burgers, he generously gives James advice about how to make an acetate and grease the palms of DJs to give his cuts precious airplay. For an instant, we are transported back to the exact moment when the lights went on in James Brown's head regarding his career, thanks to his latest fan, Little Richard. Other subplots don't go so well. Dan Aykroyd's cheerleading portrayal of James Brown's manager, Ben Bart, is sugary to a fault. So much so that a crucial scene where James all but takes Bart's management duties away from him comes and goes like a gentle breeze. I doubt the discussion with Sojan Teal when James Brown pulled the coup on Ben Bart in real life. Director Tate Taylor sugarcoats, or more accurately, neuters, as dictated by the Play It Safe script, we barely get a sense of Brown's problems with drug and alcohol abuse or his financial disasters, which are only alluded to during a band mutiny at a recording session. 
Still, the film takes flight during its many stage performances of such James Brown barn burners as Please, 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 Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, and Get Up Off of That Thing. Co-produced by Mick Jagger, the film's lively performance sequences are backed by a combination of James Brown recordings taken from live and studio tracks. The effect is that of hearing and seeing James Brown and his famously tight band delivering the hottest funk on the planet. There are plenty of bones to pick regarding James Brown's legend in Get On Up, but the music effectively drowns out any such hair splitting. Whether or not you are a fan of James Brown, you've got to see what Chadwick Boseman does in filling the performer's mythic shoes. I give this almost perfect musical biopic an A-. My sleeper pick is Finding Fela, and my guilty pleasure pick is The Strange Little Cat. My must-have DVDs are Next Goal Wins from Ketchup Entertainment, Gangster from Inception Media Group, and My Wild Affair from PBS. Considered the mother of the Nouvelle Vague, dating back to her first film, Le Pointe Court, from 1954, Agnes Varda broke new ground for the movement in 1961 with Cleo from 5 to 7, an unprecedented model of cinematic poetry. Designed to represent the passage of real time, the film follows its anxious heroine Cleo through a heightened 90-minute period of her life in Paris on June 21, 1961. Café visits, taxi rides, a singing rehearsal, watching a short film, and a chance meeting with a romantically inclined French soldier are events that disclose Cleo's transformation. Cleo's tour through the 14th and 13th arrondissements allows for Varda's gorgeously filmed Parisian locations in accurate continuity with an exacting focus on the social and political realities of public life in Paris on the first day of summer 1961. Urban art and nature play significant roles in Cleo's inward and outward expressions of her physicality, identity, intellect, and expanding regard of her place in the world. A visit to a sculpture school to pick up Cleo's modeling friend allows Varda to exhibit alluring sculptures appropriate to the era while also giving a precise example of art and commerce functioning within the culture. Cleo is not someone who would ever pose nude, but doesn't judge her friend who enjoys its liberation and as a way of making money. A color sequence introduces Cleo, played by Corinne Marchand, as she participates with a tarot card reader to discover her future. Cleo has just received word from her doctor that she has cancer in her belly. The cards seem to confirm Cleo's fear of a worst-case diagnosis. The hangman's card features prominently enough to disturb the real-life tarot card reader that Varda cast in the role. Varda reverses the viewer's expectations by using color film stock to represent the fiction of the tarot reader's premonitions via lushly rendered cards set against a background of carpet. In contrast, the reality of Cleo's quicksilver journey of self-discovery is rendered in a more nostalgic black and white atmosphere of romantic implications. Cleo, a blonde pop singer whose songs play in taxis and cafes, goes about her evening in anticipation of hearing the results of her biopsy in little more than an hour's time. We are drawn into an ever-deepening subjective empathy with Cleo, accepting and admiring Corinne Marchand's outlandish beauty within the context of Cleo's distressed state. In an especially ingenious sequence of subjective viewpoint, we see through Cleo's eyes how men and women, young and old, variously regard her. 
They make uncomfortable contact and register Cleo's lithe beauty, stunning facial features, and perfectly coiffed blonde hair. Varda captures a documentary level of reality that is mind-blowing. The multidisciplined artist Varda contrasts the subjective experience of seeing how people on the street view Cleo against her fourth wall breaking gaze directly into the camera to provide a lovely intimacy with the character. Mirrors evince the temporality of divine feminine beauty that Cleo often studies in her reflection during the first half of the story. A bevy of kittens in her spacious apartment remind us of the relentless march of time, which Cleo is hyper aware. Varda's attention to detail adds layers of structural integrity to the narrative. Every background clock, and there are many, reflects the correct time as it relates to the story. Cleo's frog and pearl ring carries a world of dramatic subtext. During Varda's 13-chapter story, Cleo gradually sheds her self and societally imposed disguises towards exposing her true identity. Cleo isn't even her real name. The filmic transportation from the ephemeral to the miraculous, from the disguised to the unveiled, speaks volumes in unaffected feminist terms about female reality in Paris in 1961. Thanks for watching and visit colesmithy.com for more.